sometime in the next few decades. Humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. That is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars. Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Red Planet Live. Today, we are with, uh, we're actually on episode four, which is fantastic. So today, we're going to be talking with some amazing guests. So I want to kind of just jump right in because we actually have a lot to go over. So I'm going to bring up into the stream James Burke, who is awesome. <laughs> uh, man, I'm so happy that you could actually join us tonight because today's episode, we're going to be talking tech and we're going to be talking with the chapter uh, heads of actually three chapters. So some of the founders, co-founders and, and major players there. So, but today we wanted to actually uh, also go over some of the stuff that uh, the Mars Society uh, is going uh, is working on from your perspective and that you're working on your end. So uh, I thought we would jump in. So first of all, James, uh, welcome. I'm glad uh, that you can make it and join us tonight. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Ron. Okay, awesome. So uh, I think, you know, first off, I mean, uh, if you want to kind of just introduce yourself, your role, uh, I guess your role with uh, with TMS uh, as a whole, as a global perspective, you know, because you're also the head of a, uh, you're also at the Seattle chapter as well. So I think from from today's perspective, we're going to be talking to you from your, your work when it comes to the Mars Society uh, as a whole. So if you could actually just maybe introduce yourself, uh, your, what you're going to be showing us today, and we'll kind of just jump right in. Yeah, well, I'm a founding member of the Mars Society. Um, my member number is 705. And uh, I've been with the Seattle chapter since we started. We used to be called the Puget Sound chapter, but we rebranded ourselves a couple years ago so that people outside of Seattle understood what that was. Um, but I'm also the director of information technology for the Mars Society. I've been in that role for 10 years now. And uh, four years ago, we started the Mars VR project. And I'm really excited to talk about Mars VR. That's our virtual reality effort to create new tools that we could use to tell the story of the human exploration of Mars and also showcase the work that we've done in Utah at our Mars Desert Research Station. Um, it was about four years ago that Dr. Zubrin and a few others um, and I talked about what we could do for VR. And we decided at that time to hold a Kickstarter. And we raised, uh, our goal was to raise $25,000. We ended up raising 31,000. And wow. we used the money to scan the Mars Desert Research Station, which is our station in Utah that we've had for since the year 2001. So this is our 20th anniversary of that station project as well. Um, and we flew a drone and we captured a square mile of terrain. And we had a couple guys that are real great experts at VR and photogrammetry, which is the science of taking a real life object and putting it into VR, making a virtual version of it. We had a couple guys go out to the base and scan everything. And uh, we, we, they, we they brought all the data back and we've processed it. And later that year in 2018, I was able to show this at our conference um, and a couple other events we had. And so um, it was a great, experiment kind of a proof of concept but it also showed us the possibility that we could do more with this so earlier this year we held another crowdfunding campaign and this time we raised over a hundred thousand dollars and that really let us get serious about delivering a real world-class experience to the public and i'm really excited tonight because i'm going to show everyone some of this for the first time um, we actually have been working all summer on this and there's not one, not two, but three different experiences that we've built. So let me take you through them. 
I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to show everybody the first one, which although it's part of our project, Mars VR, it's actually something that everyone could use in a web browser. All they need is a, is a computer and a web browser. Uh, you actually could even use this on your phone. And so this is what we call the Mars Desert Research Station 360 static environment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just refresh the browser I'm showing here so it starts at the beginning because it's going to show a guided tour of our campus. Now, we, we created this by taking a camera called a Matterport camera. Um, if, you, if you know anyone that, that works in the real estate industry, they might be familiar with Matterport cameras. It's essentially a 360 degree camera that's on a tripod and you, you take it somewhere, like say if you're going to make uh, a model of a house, you'd go ahead and set that up, this, the camera up in the house and you click a button and it would spin around and it would take a 360 view of the room it's in. And if you did this a bunch of times, you can actually create a walkthrough of the whole house. Well, that's basically what we did is we did this for the entire MDRS campus. And you can see here the applications running and it's kind of showing us this guided tour. We actually have a voiceover of this. This is a great experience for somebody that would be new to what we're doing and doesn't really understand the, about the Mars Desert Research Station, doesn't understand what we do there. This, this is a narrated guided tour. Um, you also see there's a little mini map on the bottom left that you can use to jump around. So I can actually click on one of these little dots and it'll take me right to that section of the, the campus. And I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to actually scroll around or I can use the mouse. So right now I'm just using my mouse to turn the camera around and then I can click where that little arrow is and I can go down the tunnel. So each one of these is an individual scan of the campus. And this is a great um, application to kind of just get a feel for what it's like to walk around there. We've also embedded in it a lot of little Easter eggs. So if you see that little uh, logo on the oil can there, or on the gas can there, Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a bunch of little things to find in the experience. I'm not going to show them all tonight because I want everyone to kind of hunt for them on their own. But uh, you know, this is the first experience we've built, and we're going to actually release this to the public very soon. Um, we're going to have a closed beta of this at the end of this week for our early access backers. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. actually going to go inside the Hab, and you can actually see inside the Hab some of the things we have here at the MDRS. So, so this is real time, is it? Is this, this running is, real time? This is yeah. This is actually this is in the browser. I'm clicking around, and uh, oh, it's nice. it's happening right as I click. But this is what it looks like inside the MDRS if you haven't been there before. Okay. So, so anyway, this is our first experience. It's called the static environment. It's meant for anyone to be able to use this in a web browser. What's also a really great feature of this is there's a video chat capability. So we can actually have this as a meeting space and use this as a, a meeting space for chapters or, or, or project teams or people that want to just try it out. So any questions on that? Actually, we do have a question coming in from, uh, from Sean Dell. He actually wants to know if this is going to be on Steam eventually. So this one will just be a browser environment. Um, we'll, we'll share this pretty widely from our MDRS website. But the one I want to show you next is the real good one. This is the one that's kind of the virtual reality immersive experience. So let me, let me show that. I have a video clip to play. So one of the other things we did, and that's our partner Mixed Reality, is we've actually now created a fully immersive VR environment with the campus. And we were able to go through and reconstruct all the buildings virtually. So we've created 3D models of all the buildings inside and out, the tunnels, and, and we're also working on all the objects inside. Because one of the things that we'd like to do is have training for all the crews. So imagine being able to go through the campus and actually pick things up. And if you wanted to learn how to, the, what the procedures are to put on one of our suits and go out the airlock, you can actually try that out in VR and learn that. 
that was the whole idea behind Mars VR is we wanted to give people the opportunity to train on some of our procedures at home before they got out to Utah. So that way they can really hit the ground running when they get there. And you can imagine the possibilities of an env environment such as, as this. We also could do things like simulations of the campus uh, and, the, and the procedures and the operations inside VR. So there's a lot we can do with an environment like that. And uh, we're, we're hard at work on the training procedures. We've f finished a few of them, um, but we have a lot more to show uh, as the months go by. The third env environment we worked on is a next generation VR environment that is for Mars. And so I don't have anything to show on that today, but it, you know, fasten your seatbelts on that one because there's a lot of really exciting things about that. We've got a lot of the hardware that's really on Mars, like the rovers, the Ingenuity helicopter. And so there's gonna be a lot of things that people are gonna be able to, to try out and, and visit with that one when that's ready to come. Awesome. So, so to answer your question, uh, is it going to be on Steam? Yeah, actually, it it will be. Um, the two the the two immersive experiences will be downloadable on Steam, and we'll have also unlocks. We'll have DLC or add-ons that people can purchase through Steam. But the core experience for the MDRS will be free. Cool, and I do have a question that actually came in as well. So, some uh, I have a viewer that wants to know that whether Mars VR will actually be usable from a cell phone or something like Google Cardboard. Yeah, so the first environment I showed, the static environment, you actually could use that with Google Cardboard on a cell phone. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen again, and I'll show you how to do that. Because basically, there's a little panel that you can bring out in that experience. And if you do that, let me wait till it shows up on the screen here. So if you see this little icon in the top right, if I click on that, I can actually view this in VR. And so you could use that on a device like Google Cardboard on a cell phone. And uh, you know, you'd have a pretty decent experience doing it that way. No, that's amazing. No, I mean, fantastic work. I mean, definitely congratulations to you and the team on that. I mean, that's just just phenomenal. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, we, we, we know about MDRS and, you know, people go there and they go there to, to train to be analog astronauts and they kind of go in, in the field and do, you know, and of course we don't, you know, we only hear about it or maybe we see some pictures that are coming from the crews because we had Crew 245 on here actually uh, a couple shows ago and, you know, it was fantastic to see everything they were doing, but we don't really get an inside view because I mean one thing that we have to say and I do say on most shows is that you know the MDRS is not open to the public so everybody who's wandering through aren't supposed to be there so how do we get you know how do we see what's inside there so I mean it's been it's fantastic that you're able to bring that because we can't just let people walk through it so this is really the next best thing and of course the options are really I mean VR I mean if you if I think about where VR was five years ago and where VR and AR technology is now it's it's just completely mind-blowing and and imagine what it's going to be in the next couple of years it's just especially with the neural engine the neural nets and you know they're building in specific hardware accelerated features into chips now right on the devices to make everything just extremely uh realistic and you know very smooth and high frame rates yeah it's it's been really great when i've been able to show this to people before COVID. of course um i i showed our prototype environment to 200 middle school girls in Seattle at the Museum of Flight here in Seattle. And, you know, they were blown away. Like none of them expected to be able to walk on Mars that day when they came to the museum. And um, the, the response has, has always been 100% positive. I think the only downside with VR is for some people, they get a little motion sick or they get a little bit of vertigo when they put on the headset. But that's why we built the browser-based environment. You know, you can use this on any computer, and it's just on the monitor. Um, so you don't have to you like use the high resolution heads, higher definition headsets to experience this. We wanted to get this out to a, a wide as audience as possible, so we can tell the story yeah. of what we're doing. Yeah, because that makes sense. I mean, some of these headsets. I mean, I think the Oculus, and I mean, these aren't cheap. I mean, you can spend up to into into the thousands of uh, you know for these headsets. <laughs> They are coming down in price. The Oculus Quest is a pretty popular one. The Quest 2 is the latest model, and it's about $300, and it's pretty good. I mean, it does have a closed system for the, the games and the software that come with it, 
it's not an open system by any means. It's not like having a mobile device where you can download whatever app is in the store um, and then maybe sideload things on, on your own. Um, it is pretty closed, but um, there are some other headsets out there like the HTC Vive Focus 3 that just came out that are, like you said, kind of a, over a thousand, but that are very high quality. And that one has a built-in fan, so it kind of keeps your head cool <laughs> as you're using it. But the technology is advancing just light speed. I mean, every six months, there's a new high-end headset that comes out. And uh, there's definitely no lack of innovation in that field. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions that will come in there. I know uh, before we move on to the next segment, there's actually something else I'm going to ask you as, uh, shortly as well. So we're going to go through a couple of questions here. So I'll bring this up from Libby. Uh, Interesting question. Any plans to something this tech will be on Mars? And I'm, I'm pretty sure she means literally on Mars. So I guess you're going to be putting this on, you're going to be strapping this to a dragon. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, one of the things we've talked about is what if we had someone inside the hab with a headset on and then someone out on EVA in a suit and you had a real time link between the two of them and you can actually have the person in the hab guide them and kind of you know, have the map and have sort of the, the mission, um, you know, the mission data and the objective notes. And you're like kind of talking someone through from the hab, but you're seeing everything they see. And then the person out, outside on EVA, maybe they have like an AR um, headset where they can still see everything they see, but they also see like maybe an avatar of the person in the hab. Like there's a lot of opportunity here for like a real time collaboration using VR. And I think that's, you'll see like some in some movies, you know, sci-fi mm -hmm. movies, you'll see things like that. Um, I do think that is going to happen where you'll have an astronaut working outside on Mars on the surface, working along with someone maybe up in orbit or at, in the base. Um, it's, you know, obviously there's a, a, a bit of a delay back to Earth. So you're not going to have a yep. real time link. But on the moon, you might, on the moon, it would only be a second or two. Yep. So, yep. you know, that's certainly possible there yeah yeah because i think it's only a two second round trip for the signal right to two to three seconds to go to the moon mars you got a you got a few more minutes to add on there <laughs> i think right. what is it 28 minutes all it, depends it, on it it depends on the alignment of earth and mars and yeah. obviously if earth and mars are on opposite sides of the sun then there's no link yep <laughs> yeah it's hard to move a sun they're awfully big uh so we're gonna go so we actually have another question coming in there so uh any way to bring team to map mars in metaverse are you available <laughs> and I oh, that's Lady exactly Rocket. I've heard of her before. Hey, Lady Rocket. Okay. I'd love to be on uh, the team, Matt Mars in Metaverse. Uh, if you can send me some details on that, I don't really know what that is, but it sounds fun. Yeah, and I think there's another question here. And actually, this might even be somebody to call on because I think Sean uh, is actually one of the uh, uh, members of Mars Society Canada, if I if I remember correctly. So, uh, you know, that actually may be somebody that you can talk to when it goes because I think motion sickness because I've actually used the VR headsets to play some games in the past. I had a hard time. I have to be honest with you. I had to, you know, the, I was on the PlayStation and it was making me actually feel sick. I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't cope with it. Really. Yeah, my wife, Kathy, she can't do it at all. As soon as she puts the headset on, she starts getting sick. Yeah. We tried this roller coaster one once and she got really sick from that. Um, yeah, oh, wow. I'm aware there are some ways to reduce it. And obviously the technology is evolving as well. One really simple trick you can do if you're playing a game that's making you motion sick is just nod your head like this okay. as you're moving. Um, that reduces it a bit because it's tricking your inner ear that there is a little bit of movement, even if what you see doesn't match up with what you're experiencing. That's really the cause of the motion sickness is that your inner ear is getting confused that what you're seeing isn't what you're feeling. Okay. So yeah, if you can trick it, that's a little like life hack you could do is just kind of nod your head while you're doing the yeah. VR and, and that uh, cuts down on it. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure that, you know, like you're saying, the technology is improving. So, you know, what it used to be five years ago, it probably isn't as bad today, uh, you know, with all the improvements and all the research that goes in. I mean, that's a good thing about, you know, having scientists and, you know, that are actually looking at this and saying, how do we actually make this more consumable and, and accessible for people? Because, you know, we don't want people throwing up while they're in their VR headset. <laughs> so yeah, that'll be uh, that's good. So we have another question. Will the VR visuals have a voiceover narrative that will explain and inspire? That sounds that's a fantastic question. Yeah, I might have mentioned I might have been talking too fast, but our first experience already does have a, a voiceover. Um, as you join the experience, it's actually me talking about the campus and introducing you to all the different buildings. So that yeah, that, that's part of it right now. 
Fantastic. So I do have a question that I wanted to uh, to bring up as well. Now, before you move on, because I think Mars Coin is something that you're going to go into in your next uh, portion of your segment. But I hear that uh, you actually are going to be coming up and actually uh, leading a crew at MDRS actually coming up next year. And I wonder if you could actually let us know and give your eye, you know, from a commander, because you were a commander of a mission before. Uh, you know, I was I like? was an EXO of a mission before. I went in 2018, um, and I was EXO. Susan Jewell was my commander. Um, and you're right, I am, I am going to command a crew. We were going to go in December, but of, co of course, because of COVID, we had to we had to postpone our mission. I have for crew members that are French, and so they couldn't travel. Unfortunately, very sad. We've been training together for almost two years now. So now we're out. I believe we're out till April of. 23 right now, but hopefully we'll get pulled back in a little bit to next fall. Um, you know, it's it was a really amazing experience for me to go to the MDRS for the first time, having been part of the Mars Society and having helped out with the websites and all the other IT needs for years before that. Actually going there was just something completely different. Um, I likened it, I'm a scuba diver, and so it was very similar to scuba diving trips I've gone on before where you sort of wake up and you eat breakfast and you talk about what you're going to do that day and then you gear up and then you go out and then you do a bunch of stuff and then you come back inside and you're just wiped just exhausted and sweaty and you, you're dehydrated um and, you, and then you do that like every day for a week or two weeks um so that's it's a really it's a little grueling but it's very rewarding and also another thing i noticed is you're just busy all the time it's just like being an astronaut because you have so much you want to do, and and mm -hmm. you know you have at, at night you have your crew, uh, crew reports to write, you're planning out your experiments during the day, you know you're still you're still you're still trying to kind of keep the hab clean and cook food for everyone, um, so you kind of rotate some of those duties around the crew, so it's 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 actually a pretty intense experience, but it's a lot of fun. It's nothing nothing like a, anything else I've ever experienced. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking, when I was talking to Crew Two Forty Five, I mean, they were talking. Water was actually one of the major uh, things that they actually had to con be concerned about, and they had to monitor their usage. So, resource usage, should, you know, was extremely important because I mean, the, the whole idea is this is a simulation. You know, you want to be as realistic as possible. If you are actually in a hab on Mars, these are things that are actually important. I mean, these are these are life or death situations. Uh, you run out of water, you're, you're you know, Earth is quite a you know far ways away. You can't just. <laughs> You can't you can't actually call up skip the dishes. No, and, and, and we're in the middle of the Utah desert. I mean, it is not like there can be real emergencies. And in the and over the years we've had real emergencies where we've had to break sim and take people to the hospital because people do get dehydrated and other things out there. No, I mean it's it kind of sounds corny, but after a few days you kind of do feel like you're on Mars. You know, you look out the window and it looks like Mars. You're only with the people that are in the mission with you. You don't see anyone else. Um, you do feel isolated because you are isolated. You are in the middle of the Utah desert, you know, two hours away from the nearest city, Grand Junction, Colorado. Um, so it's 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 the closest thing you're going to get to actually going there. That's awesome. Well, I think that's the last of the question that came in for the Mars VR. So I want to definitely thank you for your uh, uh, for all the effort that you put into there, and it's fantastic. So I think you know, moving on, uh, let's actually talk about mars coin you know i think that's something that uh uh i don't know a lot about this so you're you're here to educate me and everybody else i think uh, when it comes to this because i know like nothing <laughs> okay so, so Mar so mars coin is a really fun thing it, it's a cryptocurrency like bitcoin it's actually a copy of bitcoin a legal copy of bitcoin we have a member his name's leonard lopin he created this in 2014 and um he donated 500,000 of these to the Mars Society when the project was founded. He also donated 500,000 to Mars One, which at the time was very popular. It was this um, one way to Mars project. A lot of people signed up for it and their idea was to have like a reality show type of revenue funding model. Um, that project didn't work out. I found out about it because I edit all of our videos and led it for our conference. And Leonard came to our conference and presented this and gave the donation to Dr. Zubrin. And so I actually was watching the video as I was editing it. And I was like, wow, I missed this at the conference. This is really cool. And so I, I talked to him. I had dabbled a little bit with Bitcoin 
back in 2011. Bitcoin was started in, tw in 2009. Uh, in 2011, I kind of bought some at $100 and sold some at $190, and I thought I was the smartest guy ever. Um, <laughs> and uh, by the way, it's trading at about $46,000 yeah. uh, right now. Yeah. So, um, but uh, Mars Coin, you know, it's it's a really great project. It's it, it's something where we have this whole community of people that are trying to promote uh, the Mars Coin. They call themselves the Mars Coin Army, and you know, I've talked about this with Dr. Zubrin. We had we had because we're a nonprofit, we have to be really careful, sort of, about how we handle projects like this. You know, um, we can take cryptocurrency donations, and we a couple years ago announced that we were going to take Bitcoin as a donation. Uh, we had consulted with some legal experts in Colorado where we're headquartered about how we can do that um, completely ethically and above board. And we also um, determined that we can we can cheer on the Mars Coin project, but it's an independent project and it's run by Leonard out of his Mars Coin Foundation, which is out of Florida. But um, you know, I, I help out where I can. I'm an advisor to the project and I helped Leonard organize a conference back in June called the Mars Coin Expo. And you can see behind my shoulder the I was there t-shirt for that conference. It was a virtual conference, but we had a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it's a project that uh, definitely is, is a, I think if it's successful, it can really help out the Mars Society. One of the things I was able to do back to sort of the Mars One um, is when that project Mars One was um, was clear to everyone that they weren't going to succeed. I reached out to Bass Landsdorp and said, "Hey, that those five hundred thousand Mars coins that you guys got, you're not going to need those anymore. Could we have those? Could the Mars Society have those?" And he agreed. So we actually have all one million of the original donation uh, now, and there's only thirty three million in circulation. So that's a pretty large percentage of it, and. Um, so anyway, they're, you know, they fluctuated a lot in value. A couple of years ago, they were worth less than a penny. But earlier this year, they were worth 25 cents at one point each. So okay. you can do the math there. That was a, that was a pretty um, exciting day for the Mars Society. Cool. But we're, well, how do you buy that? Long -term. OK, so how do you actually go out and buy that? I mean, I, I, be honest with you, I know so little about cryptocurrency. I wouldn't even know where to buy Bitcoin. So I, if you like, how do we go and buy Mars coin? Like, how do we actually invest in and, and donate? Sure. Well, the first thing I want to say is I'm not an investment advisor and this is not investment <laughs> advice. Um, and you need to do your own research because cryptocurrencies are very risky uh, investments. Mm -hmm. So people have lost money in them. And there's also a lot of fraud in that industry. Um, but essentially, the way you, you the way you would acquire Mars Coin is first you would take some U.S. dollars or you could use euros, and you would first buy Bitcoin. And there's a lot of ways to buy Bitcoin here in the U.S. You can use an exchange called Gemini. You could use another one called Coinbase. They're just websites you go to. It's kind of like using PayPal. You set up an account. You associate it with your bank account. And you can buy Bitcoin that way, or you could use a credit okay. card to buy Bitcoin. And then once you have your Bitcoin, then you need to find a place that exchanges Bitcoin for Mars coin. And currently, over the years, there's been a lot of them. But currently, as of right now, there's two of them. Uh, the one I use a lot is called XT.com, and they're in Hong Kong. Um, and again, do your own research. Um, I've used that exchange a lot this year. It's It seems very legitimate to me. I've successfully deposited and withdrawn money out of there. But do your own research and um, you know, just bear in mind that you don't want to keep stuff on an exchange. You want to ultimately have it held locally in your own wallet. You can learn more about MarsCoin and download a wallet for it by going to marscoin.org. And you'll find That's out all awesome. about the project. Okay, awesome. Thanks, uh, James. So I think you know what we can do, because I know one of the final things that you wanted to talk about is we actually have the annual International Mars Society Convention coming up October 14th to 17th, uh, which is going to be all virtual this year uh, again as well. Uh, of course, we know why. And uh, I thought maybe if you could actually talk a little bit about the conference and uh, or the convention, sorry, and what's going on. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have a couple questions coming from the audience in regards to, you know, uh, registration. But if you could take that away and kind of give us a little bit of uh, some info on that. 
yeah, you can learn all about our conference and register for it at our website, marsociety.org. This is our second year in a row doing a virtual conference. Last year's was extremely successful for us. We had 10,000 attendees. Just to give put that in perspective, a typical year for us, like in 2019, we we're at University of Southern California. We had 400 attendees. Uh, the year before yeah. that, we were at Pasadena Convention Center. I think we had 500. So um, I think the most we've ever had was in the, the 2001 or two convention at Stanford. We had a thousand. That was a big deal for us. So last year we had 10,000, and we had the NASA administrator was a speaker. Elon <laughs> Musk was a speaker. Yeah as well as pretty much everybody we asked to come speak was at our conference last year. And so um, this year um, we have Pam Melroy, the deputy administrator of NASA. She'll, she's our headline keynote speaker, as well as Robert Zubrin and Chris McKay and all, all the usual um, Mars mission uh, experts will be there. So we'll have representation from all the teams at NASA, perseverance, ingenuity, curiosity, insight. We'll also have all kinds of different commercial and, and other um, international uh, speakers as well. So it's always a great event, four days. We put it all online, just like we do our in-person event. We're gonna have four days of programming, including evening stuff. And it's a smart, like Zubrin calls it a smorgasbord of content. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and the one from last year and all the previous years is all up on YouTube. We actually, every year we put everything up on YouTube. I do a lot of that. And uh, we have over a thousand videos on YouTube now. It's kind of like our own little library of Mars technology and science and exploration concepts. So, you know, if you don't, if you're not able to watch the event live, you can absolutely check it out afterwards by going to our YouTube page. Yeah, I mean, it's all about content. I mean, it's really what we're doing here, right? I mean, we're, you know, really creating content to help actually, you know, promote and to advocate for, you know, humans to Mars and, and, and Mars in general. So, I mean, it really is just about getting uh, that this out there uh, to the widest possible audience that we can. And, you know, you showing up and, you know, all the great guests that come on the show are really just part of that process. And, you know, I have to, you know, continually thank you all every single week that, you know, that you take time out of your busy schedules to come on and speak with me and speak with the audience about that. So it's just, just fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to the conference and there's going to, there's absolutely amazing speakers coming up. But one question I did have though, because I think with virtual conferences, like how, how are people going to network? Because I think that's something that people look forward to doing at a conference is, you know, how do you go and have a chat with your friends and, you know, meet new people? How do you do that virtually? Yeah, it's something we've thought through a lot. And we have an amazing partner, Hopin, that is helping us with the software for the conference. Uh, you might remember last year we used a software called Attendify. And it's the same software. Yeah. It's just that they were acquired by a new company called Hopin, which also has its own set of products for um, conferences. And so... There's gonna be a lot of different ways that people can interact with each other and um, talk to each other, set up meetings and have virtual calls with uh, other attendees. So there's, there's gonna be a lot of options there for networking as well as uh, asking questions of the speakers live and having them interact with you. Awesome. Okay. Well, I really, uh, you know, want to say thank you again, James, for coming on and uh, spending some time with us tonight. And uh, just one more ask from you. Uh, I have the other, so the chapter heads for three of the uh, Mars Society chapters are actually on in the queue. Uh, do you mind if I bring them up for a second with you? I know you have to run yeah. off really, really soon. And just no, to say hi. And, you know, I always use this as a uh, opportunity for a photo op as well. So you know, she'll have big smiles and, you know, hey, how's it going, everybody? How's it <laughs> Welcome. So, yeah. So, anyway, uh, if, yeah, just I'll give you guys an opportunity uh, before we introduce you guys. Uh, you know the chapters and you know the heads of the chapters that we come to speak on behalf of. If you guys have any questions for James in regards to the uh, to the presentation that he has or comments. No, I'm a big fan of his VR project, um, and uh, I. I saw, uh, I heard a lot of stories from some of our NorCal members about uh, all the uh, technology you guys were using on your uh, um, MDRS uh, crew, and it was very impressive. Well, thanks, Scott. Coming from you, that means a lot because you're the original guy with the Mars Sim project, so oh, I've you. admired your work as well. 
I, uh, I don't have a question for James, but I do want to say thank you so much for what you do. And uh, I can't wait to dive into Mars VR. That looks like it's going to be awesome. Thanks, Evan. Thank you. Uh, okay, good I think that's all. Julio, anything? <laughs> hey, Julio. <laughs> uh, yeah. Congratulations. Okay. I, I really appreciate the commitment of James uh, yeah. because I, I can see during the Mass Society Convention a lot of work and a lot of rooms to organize, a lot of panels. And it's a uh, great work and I'm a great fan of James. And uh, all, all years I'm very excited about how this is feasible. Also, also the the Musa site, right, uh, James? I'm sorry? Uh, uh, also, you are engaged with Moon Society. Oh, the Moon Society. Yeah, I also help yeah. that group out a little bit. They're a lot smaller than the Mars Society. But you know yeah. and and focused on earth's closest neighbor but uh, uh we had a conference earlier this year called the lunar development conference that was pretty uh fun so yeah helping them out as well sometimes yeah i think you're uh, uh you're definitely busy james <laughs> i mean i bug you about things you know i need you know this is you know i need this or i need an email fixed or this i mean you know with the duties that you do for the mars society plus all the other volunteering and other initiatives that you look after the fact that your eyes are even open right now <laughs> <laughs> and able to do this is is just a testament to your to your agility. So so just fantastic. Yeah, thanks a lot. There's actually one other event I wanted to mention since we're talking about other stuff I do. The NASA Space Apps Challenge is this international hackathon, and I run the Seattle event, and it's actually on October first and the weekend of October first through third. Um, that's coming up. So if you're interested in learning about how to write an application uh, and learn about uh, working with data, going after some of the NASA challenges that for that event, go to um, NASA Space Apps Challenge site. I think it's spaceappschallenge.org. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, James. And I know you, you have to run. So I wanted to thank you again for coming on. And uh, it was a fabulous presentation. And uh, I guess uh, next time I might see you, it might be virtually at the conference. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Have a great night. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, James. Take care. Okay, so guys, welcome. I guess uh, that was kind of a bit of a, a unexpected, unorthodox, or kind of bringing you in at the, uh, <laughs> like that. So thank you very much for uh, entertaining my uh, dis disorder and uh, chaos that I like to throw in here from time to time. So I uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, you guys coming on tonight. You know, we wanted to kind of talk about, you know, we wanted to do the show into two segments. So, you know, we want to talk, you know, because one thing that's uh, really important to highlight is that you know the mars society is you know has a lot i mean i think it's 33 international chapters you know all the way from peru to canada from uk to egypt india to japan and i mean the us alone has 22 chapters and so i mean the chapters are really just i mean they're the 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 lifeblood of really what's going on in the mars society and continuing that advocacy you know from going forward so i really wanted to uh, to really thank you for for coming on and you know, speaking with us tonight. So what I wanted to do is I'm kind of going to go around and let you introduce yourselves, introduce your chapter and kind of go into, you know, what you're working on. And, uh, you know, last and not but least, we want to make sure that we talk about, you know, how people join your chapter. So, you know, if depending on, you know, whether they're in your local region, you know, in the country, it all depends, you know, some countries have a single chapter and of course other countries like the U S has 22. So it could be more localized and more regional, as opposed to more more country specific. So uh, I'll start at my top right there. So Evan, uh, welcome to the show. And if you wanted to kind of introduce yourself, uh, your chapter, and uh, we'll go just jump right into the points that you want to talk about. Sure thing. Ron, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Evan Plant Weir, and I am a co-founder of the Mars Society of Canada. Mars Society of Canada is a federal uh, registered not-for-profit and um, We've got some pretty exciting stuff going on uh, right now. So one of the programs that uh, I think is really great is called the Mars Explorer Program. And the Mars Explorer Program is basically going to be uh, an open source online learning platform for young students to develop an understanding and get excited about all things Mars. Uh, so it's going to be targeting uh, uh, grades four to six and it's being developed by a uh, primary school teacher uh, named Hayden Hanna, who's doing a really fantastic job there. 
Uh, initially, it's going to be uh, rolled out as a collection of materials and projects that teachers will be able to integrate into their existing curriculum. So an example of one of the projects that uh, teachers will have access to would be an exercise where uh, young kids, the students, are asked to design a 3D Mars habitat, uh, or Mars colony rather. So uh, essentially they'd be learning uh, a bit of computer software with uh, open source 3D environment creation and uh, they'll also be learning, you know, what is required for a human to survive on Mars. And I'm really excited about this, uh, this endeavor because as everyone here knows, um, you know, many of the young children of today are going to be very likely going to be settlers on Mars, you know, perhaps in decades to come. So introducing them these concepts early, I think is great. Um, we also have something called uh, Mars Log and Mars Log is a blog on our website. It's a collection of articles, infographics, and interviews. We have contributors with a background in physics and engineering who are exploring, uh, in their articles are exploring ideas like, you know, how are spacecraft uh, maneuvered or propelled? Uh, or things like, how is oxygen uh, going to be made on Mars? What's the chemistry and the science behind that? Uh, we have contributors such as myself with a background in psychology and sociology who are writing articles about um, how the settlement of Mars is going to impact the way our, our species uh, thinks and interacts with itself. We have interviews, like we recently had an interview with a Canadian Space Agency scientist, Tim Hultigan, who uh, has been instrumental in the Mars sample return campaign. And uh, one of the newest series on Mars Log is uh, a series called Building Athens. And Building Athens is exploring uh, what are the unique opportunities and uh, restrictions for the first uh, academic institutions on Mars. So, you know, what's, what's going to be involved there? What's it going to be like? What are, the, what are the unique things that people will have to learn or unique ways that people will learn on Mars? So that's Mars Log. I, we've got great feedback on that, and I, I uh, encourage everyone to check it out on our website, which is marssociety.ca. Another thing I want to mention is something that uh, we've got in the works called the Mars Analog Mobile Station, or MEMS for short. And uh, basically what it's going to be is just like it sounds like, it's going to be a, a mobile analog uh, Mars station that can be deployed basically anywhere in Canada where there's a road. So if there's road access, it can go there. Uh, it's gonna be basically on a trailer chassis and a, a modular system um, with uh, two main priorities. One is obviously to facilitate research associated with Mars and, and, and Mars uh, exploration. Um, and examples of that might be controlled environment agriculture, you know, learning how to, learning how to grow crops on Mars using MAMS. And the second priority is using it as a platform to interact directly with the public all throughout Canada in order for them to get sort of a hands-on, uh, you know, visual look within MAMS at what an analog station is like and why Mars is interesting and why Mars is important. So two scenarios you might imagine MAMS in. One, uh, MAMS could be deployed to an analog environment that's within you know, a logistically practical range of a Canadian academic institution so that uh, members of that institution can engage in that analog research. And maybe a second scenario would be uh, MAMS being rolled out to something like the Canadian National Exhibition where the, the MAMS is used as an as a exhibit for people to learn about Mars and why it's important and why it's interesting. Um, and uh, I also want to mention, actually, that uh, Mars Desert Research Station was, of course, mentioned earlier with, with James's awesome presentation about Mars VR. And actually, one of our directors at the Mars Society of Canada is going to be deploying to MDRS with Crew 228 uh, this month. And so we're going to be following that really closely, and we're, we're very excited to cheer Jin on. And, uh, and uh, Jin will be operating as the health and safety officer. Uh, for that okay. deployment. So he's going to be keeping everyone happy and safe. So go Jin. Go and Jin. I love, Jin. I love Jin. Yes. Oh, <laughs> he's good. We're lucky yeah. to have him. Hey Jin. 
Uh, and uh, lastly, I'll just I'll just plug our website again and, and let you know uh, where to go to find out more about us because we've got lots more in the works. Um, we're at marsociety.ca. And if you're located in Canada and you find Mars interesting and, and the, our journey to a multi-planetary future exciting, uh, consider becoming a member uh, at marsociety.ca. And your membership is really important to helping us do all these things and more. So that about wraps it up for me. And um, yeah, looking forward to welping, welcoming everyone to our growing community. Oh, awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm, I actually uh, have the privilege of being a member there myself. I, of course, I'm, I'm busy where I don't get to volunteer as much as I, uh, I would love, but I, I've definitely, you know, enjoyed my discussions and my time, uh, you know, where I get to speak with everybody there and you and Glenn and, and, and Jen. And I mean, it's just, it's just fantastic. I mean, you know, I really appreciate, uh, you know, everything you guys are doing and it's just, it's, it's so, you know, for me, of course, you know, we're both from Canada. So, you know, it's so, it's so heartwarming for me to see that there's uh, so much initiative going on here, especially that, uh, you know, with the direction that you guys are, that we, I guess we are taking uh, with really educating the youth and inspiring the youth because you really have to get, you know, people interested from children. I think we all have these moments if, uh, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but if I think of myself, you know, where I, you know, had my interest in space and Mars, it was really from, you know, from a childhood and me coming across, I mean, uh, you might have heard this name, Carl Sagan, <laughs> you know, reading and opening, you know, that book for the first time when I was younger. And that really is what did it for me. And it was Cosmos. You know, when I actually went and looked at that, it was like, wow, you got to be kidding me. That's out there. <laughs> and and it, it just all went from there. So I think it's really important that we make this accessible to children because we don't know what's going to inspire them. But if we don't actually show them, they'll never know. And I think it's such an important thing that uh, that we're doing for that. And, you know, and I definitely want to, you know, give you a huge credit for that. So, uh, so Scott, uh, Julio, uh, is there any questions that you have for Evan? I'm impressed with all of the, the projects you guys have going on. That sounds wonderful. Awesome. Thanks, and Scott. So what gonna... oh. Yes, I, I have a question uh, to, to Evan. Uh, it's about uh what are the, the connection with the the flash line uh analog station there's uh some plan or some connections about the the flash line or f mars uh, operations yeah great uh, great question julio and thanks for asking uh mars side of canada definitely hopes to uh be associated with getting some uh some deployments to f mars and actually one of the one of the priorities that I didn't mention for MAMS, for that mobile analog facility, is actually to serve as a way to, uh, to promote FMARS and, and other analog facilities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we want to see action at FMARS, which is in the, the Canadian Arctic, of course, and uh, we want to be involved there for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I have a question of my own, actually, Evan. So how long do you think that uh, before we get you know, let's say buy-in from the Canadian government to say, you know, when are we going to actually have like an official, you know, Mars Society Canada analog station? You know, what are your hopes? Let's say, let, let's not put a, a firm line on that, but, you know, based on the work that you're doing and maybe the vibe and the feeling that you guys are getting, you know, what are we looking at? Uh, as in a timeline for the mobile analog facility? Yeah. Um. I'm probably not going to speculate there. It, it's, we're in the preliminary phase of putting it together so you know this is a medium to long-term goal um though that said it's all contingent on on how quickly our membership grows and how how fast mm -hmm. our, our funding comes together for it you know if if uh if there's a a really generous uh <laughs> you know contributor out there that wants to that wants to fund the whole thing we could do it tomorrow um mm -hmm. but uh we'd say you know in the coming uh, years say five years out or okay or no, that's fantastic. Well, thank you, Evan, for sure. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, what I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was fantastic. Evan, thank you very much for your presentation and for really, you know, sharing all that with us. And, you know, go Canada. <laughs> go Canada. I'm a little biased. I'm a little biased. So I want to kind of, so I'll move around clockwise. So uh, Julio, uh, so moving on to, so you are uh, the chapter head for Mars Society Brazil. So uh, if you want to, you know, take it away, introduce yourself and kind of maybe just jump right into what you guys are doing, what you're working on and uh, and some of the membership information. 
Yes, uh, thanks so much. I am a professor in a Brazilian university, UFRN, or University Federal of Rio Grande do Norte State. Uh, also, we start our chapter here, uh, I believe, during 2018 or 2019. Uh, we are, in this case of Brazil, we are like a movement, a social movement, not a formal organization here. Also, I prepare a, a short presentation, if possible, share. Uh, okay, let me share here. Yep, my... you just uh, click share screen, and uh, okay. from there it should pop in, and then you should be able to take it from there. Okay, I'll try to be quick, just look in my minutes. Uh, yep. Okay, it's possible to see my screen. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in there right now. There we uh, go. Wonderful. Yes, uh, we're talking a little. Uh, my first contact with my society was during the uh, my society 2016 in during in, in my society uh, in in, in uh, Catholic University in, in Washington D.C. Uh, we did a presentation there also. Uh, after this, this is a photo in our university here in Brazil with some students. Uh, also here with some some. Uh, very happy about <laughs> to be part of my society. Uh, then since since uh, COVID nineteen, uh, we uh, started virtual activities. One of the activities was uh, the space habitat event, an international event. We received more than thirty uh, uh, applications. It was in the end of twenty twenty. Also with participation with Professor Robert Zubrin. Uh, also, uh, since uh, uh, during this year, we did a lot of activities of also with some lectures. Uh, also, uh, we received a message from Robert Zubrin. A lot of circle of events also following the uh, the hope of perseverance launch and landing. Also, the, uh, the ingenuity test and also we organize a urine night. Also, in June of this year, we organized a uh, we organized a, the space of that event with more than sixty uh, applications, sixty abstracts. Uh, these are like a, one of the uh, registrations, uh, one of our meetings. Uh, now, uh, yesterday we we watching the uh, the the second episode, uh, also showing the Doctor Science. Okay. Uh, also was a is a photo from our meeting yesterday. Also tomorrow we'll be watching the we will we'll have a watching party to watch the inspiration for launching uh, tomorrow. Uh, and also tomorrow will be I am a, also a coordinator of a space analog station in Brazil called Habitat Marte. Uh, and tomorrow we'll be receiving here. I am now I, I am in the uh, in the our facility, and tomorrow we'll be receiving the president of Brazilian Space Agency here. Uh, also, I'd like to, to show uh, uh, just uh, some some minutes about Tati Marti. Uh, we are, when we are talking about Brazil, we are talk, uh, hearing a lot about the rainforest, uh, but the rainforest is an area like this. Uh, but we are located uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, also in, in, uh, as in America. Uh, there is a different ecosystem, and we are based in a semi-arid region, region here, in the corner of South America. In this case, we are based here in the corner of South America. And this is a typical photo from our landscape during the uh, during summer, okay? Uh, this is uh, the photo of our uh, our facilities. In this case, we have an uh, auditorium, uh, the main facility. And this blue area is our greenhouse. Uh, this is uh, uh, a blueprint of, of our of our uh, complex, also presenting a large area of greenhouse. Uh, in this case, we are trying to develop a self-sustaining habitat. Uh, connected with sanitation, also water, and also sewage reuse, and also uh, producing food in a closed system, also using the solar panels. Uh, here we have some photos from our uh, 
Also, in, we have aqu aquaponics. This is a is a til tilapia fish. Okay. Uh, also, a photo of a second uh, aquaponic system system operate operating as this is kind of ex scheme of our area as some food producing in the greenhouse. Uh, we are also interested the, uh, about the, the indigenous plants, like some cactus, uh, also researching about uh, the possibility to use the, the like cactus to uh, produce food, to uh, space food, uh, doing some experiments about, about it. And something interesting about our location is a, is a extinct volcano. Uh, it's a 45 minutes driving. And in this area, we, we have, uh, we did analysis of, of the soil. Uh, something interesting about this, the, the sample analysis is uh, present uh, uh, many uh, common characteristics with the Mojave analog soil. Uh, the Mo Mojave analog soil is used uh, by, uh, is used, uh, by uh, uh, NASA in, in Pasadena, JPL. Uh, this also other interesting things we are creating a, a second uh, uh, analog uh, place. It's a uh, we are calling the lava cave habitat. Uh, this is a recent photo from from the from the area. Also, we are we receive one of the participants of Paulson program. Uh, he he looks we he perceives that this area this lava cave habitat presents a great potential in terms of the uh, in situ resource utilization uh, in, in this case we are preparing as necessary some some months to uh, uh, install more more equipment in this area uh, also since the until march of last year we we had six missions and 22 participants and since COVID, uh, we stopped the missions, the, the, the in-person missions, and we developed a methodology of virtual missions. And in last year, we had more than 30 missions, achieving 36 and more 200 participants. And now we are having more, 100, more than 100 participants during 2021, and also uh, we are developing now uh, 90 missions during this year. In this case, we are uh, maybe the station with the number, largest number of annual missions, also the, the greenhouse, uh, also the only analog station in the southern hemisphere, also operate the aquaponic system. In this case, we are the, uh, all the numbers, we have more than 80 missions and more than 400 participants. Uh, this is uh, in the virtual missions. This we are uh, uh, inviting the participants to imagine a, a space a station on Mars. Also, the participants will be chiefs of, of some facilities, seven facilities. And our results is sharing on uh, YouTube. Also, these are uh, we have more than more uh, the participants from more than 30 countries. And now we since June we we restarted the in place submission. This is the, a photo in the volcano uh, close to us uh, during the last weekend. Uh, and this is a, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is my presentation. I uh, just, I uh, thanks for the opportunity to, and also the, our activities in our society is very, very connected with the, with the, our analog station here. Well, thank you, Julio, for that. That's fantastic. You guys are working on a lot of stuff. I really, I actually really appreciate the uh, the research that you're putting in, especially for the soil analysis. And I mean, that's just that's really hardcore work. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's really getting in, you know, getting in there and the stuff that you would actually do if you were actually on Mars, and actually, you know, which which is su such amazing when you actually think about all the stuff that goes into the simulations, and the fact that you can do this and actually really put, you know, real world, a real other world, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, things into play. So it's actually fantastic. So really appreciate it. Uh, let me just double check here. So we have that. And great. So is there any questions that are, uh, Scott, Evan, anything that you actually want to uh, ask uh, Julio? No, I think I had met Julio at one of the Mars Society conventions uh, a few years ago. And uh, Pasadena, Pasadena. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I've been very impressed with the work you've been doing uh, in Brazil with your uh, 
with your uh, Mars habitat there. It's uh, it's amazing the number of missions you have uh, you guys have going on right now. Yep. Yeah. Also, next year uh, we we are waiting uh, international missions because since COVID uh, we had some sanitary barriers to travel to Brazil, but now it's a uh, very safer now. Uh, also, the the number of 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 deaths are decreasing a lot, and I believe it will be more feasible. We receive the international missions since uh, the beginning of next year. Cool. You know, I think one one interesting thing, especially you know, Evan, with you guys, you know, it's Canada looking to get you know, uh, you know, the, the analog station set up. Is that there's so much. Uh, you know, with with Julio and with the Mars Society, uh, with MDRS, what they're doing, there's actually a lot of people to talk to, and you know, to kind of help through that process. So, you know, it's it's amazing that you know we have such a such a broad and diverse community that we can actually talk to and say, you know, what do we do next? And, you know, and there's a lot of act people out there with a lot of information that can actually really help answer that question, which is fantastic. Absolutely, Julio. Thank you for what you do. I've never been to Brazil. I hope that one day maybe I can come and uh, take a look at your analog facility. It sounds amazing. Yeah, in February we'll be receiving a, a Canadian, a Canadian group here, uh, with some some connected with some uh, Canadian universities, and I'm very happy about to uh, make this this happen. Uh, also, I believe this is uh, something that we commented in a recent uh, meeting. Uh, maybe it would be interesting. We have the if you if it is happening the uh, if I have need the the missions in different stations in this during the same time, maybe the one one station will be having a like a common protocol with all the station, like stations in different parts of Mars, in different regions. Well, uh, this would be interesting to try to like uh, develop this <laughs> this challenge. That's fantastic. Thank you, Julio. I really appreciate it. Your presentation was just 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 amazing. I, I can't believe actually how much you're actually doing down in the analog station in Brazil. It's just just incredible. And I mean, it must just be beautiful yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, and also tomorrow we'll be receiving the president of Brazil Space Agency. He, wow. uh, uh, but let 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 try to know if if, if it will be possible they they give some support to the initiative. Okay. Cool. And for joining a chapter, just to put uh, mention this to everybody out there, so we actually have our chapters.marsociety.org. So if you're looking to join the Brazil chapter or uh, form a chapter of your own, then you can actually find the Brazil chapter and any of the chapters that we're talking to today and one of the other 33 as well. You can actually find on our site at uh, chapters.marsociety.org. And so thank you very much, Julio. And uh, I think, you know, last but not least, we want to move on to Scott. Scott Davis from NorCal. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. So I'll let you just take it away and jump right into your uh, your presentation. Introduce yourself and go right ahead. We are not one of these big national chapters. We're just a small <laughs> little regional one. Uh, we're, we're with the uh, Northern California chapter. We're mostly uh, centered around uh, Silicon Valley in California. Um, and, uh, I've been with the chapter for about 13 years. The chapter has been around since the founding of the Mars Society. And, uh, we've done a, a lot of work. Um, one of our big projects, uh, is to, uh, create, we created, designed, created, and built all of the analog SIM suits currently used at the Mars Desert Research Station and has been used for, I don't know the last six years at least. Um, so they've they have a lot of mileage on these suits, um, and uh, we uh, not only do that, but we also refurbish them every summer between crew seasons. Uh, so we we take them back to California and clean them and repair them and try to make some small improvements on them for the upcoming season. And there are eleven suits in all. Uh, basically three different designs. And uh, we currently are in the middle of a refurbishment um, summer, and this upcoming weekend we're going to be delivering the suits back to the MDRS. The uh, crew season will start the following weekend. So That's awesome. We've been working a lot on these, and it's been quite difficult this summer due to uh, the pandemic. Um, 
So we've only been able to hold a few work parties and um, just a few people uh, able to work on them at a time. But uh, they're coming along and I think they're in pretty good condition for the upcoming cruise season. Cool. Um, Do you have any pictures that you actually have available that you could show us? Uh, I don't know. I, I've got one of the helmets right here. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I mean, we still got some things to put on, but we yeah. will have new clear domes so that we won't have the scratched up clear domes uh, that they've had in the last season. Um, we didn't actually do refurbishment last summer because with the pandemic, they weren't sure if they were going to even have a cruise season this last year, but they were able to have a, a couple of crews, um, but it was very light. So we're kind of doing two years worth of uh, refurbishment. Uh, we also support the, uh, the suits at the MDRS so that when any of the crews have any technical issues, any of the crew engineers, uh, we will help walk them through uh, troubleshooting any problems with the suits. And uh, occasionally we will send replacement parts when necessary. Um, thank you. Uh, we are also working on designing a next generation SIM suit for the MDRS. And uh, it's still in the design process right now, but we hope to get it funded and uh, um, maybe for the uh, Cruise, the following cruise season, not this upcoming one. Uh, we might have some brand new suits that will look nicer, be lighter, and still have that feel of what it's like to be in a suit on Mars that we've been trying to go with. Cool. Um, so that's one of our big projects and has been taking a lot of time the last couple of months. I, I have all the suits at my house right now and they take up <laughs> a lot of space. You wear them uh, around the backyard, don't you? <laughs> I, I I have walked around wearing the suits just to kind of get the feel of them. Uh, we've, we've got some new 3D printed uh, neck rings that are about half the weight of the previous ones, which we hope will make it a lot easier on people's uh, neck and back strain this year. Um, and uh, But all of our existing suits were basically made out of common hardware that have been repurposed for uh, for suits. So for example, in this helmet, the uh, air connectors are PVC pipes. Here we go. You can see the uh, PVC connectors. The uh, clear domes are, are from a company that primarily makes them for security camera domes. So they have the, the domes upside down that will have the security cameras inside. And the backs of the helmets um, are made from a trash can lid, a rounded trash can lid with a swivel, um, a swivel uh, lid on it. So these were all kind of made out of parts that we made to work into suits for the most part. For our next generation suit, we hope to uh, be able to 3D print uh, and otherwise manufacture many of the, the parts on the suit uh, specifically for uh, this simulation rather than just making do with what we can find and make work like we have with the existing suits. So that's our big goal for the, uh, for the uh, next generation suit. Um, we also have uh, two uh, robots that we take to public uh, educational outreach events and have kids drive them around. We have a, uh, a, a laptop ground station that um, will show the video feed from the robots and we can the kids can use a joystick to drive the robots around and uh, we find this is a very popular and educational um, hands-on experience for kids uh, let me show you one of our robots real quick here this is going to be good <laughs> this, this one is named phoenix sorry i'm trying to get space for it here and uh, awesome. yeah, it was originally a, a Carnegie Mellon uh, designed robot, uh, designed for, as a university research robot using as much off the shelf parts as possible. And uh, we have been working a lot on upgrading it and uh, upgrading the operating system on it. And we normally take this to a lot of uh, educational outreach events. However, the last couple of years have been very um, difficult due to the pandemic. So 
events have been kind of not available for us. But let me say to any of the chapters, if you can get involved with educational outreach events, that is a wonderful thing to be a part of. It's a great way of attracting new members. It's a great way of interacting with and educating the public, uh, inspiring kids who will be the next generation of uh, Mars astronauts. And uh, you can find out what events are happening at your local museums um, and innovation fairs, maker fairs, uh, all these sorts of places are, are great opportunities. Uh, set up a nice booth, uh, have some hands-on activities, some video screens. It's a wonderful way of interacting with the public. That's awesome. I think one thing to mention too is that it's not always just inspiring people to to become astronauts. We always talk about STEM or STEAM, you know, and it's that, you know, when it goes to, you know, settling Mars, we're gonna need people of of all different sorts and backgrounds and and, and skill sets. I mean, from electricians to to everybody else. So don't always think that, well, I don't know if I can be an if I want to be an astronaut, but you can still actually be part of of the mission to to settle and be multiplanetary because we're going to need everybody from from every kind of background and every kind of skill set uh, to make that possible. I know there's going to be you know the initial leading the way. We need the scientists and we need the astronauts and we need the engineers to actually get us, you know, to get us there. But once we get there, we're going to need a lot of uh, a lot of diversity when it comes to the actual talents. Uh, so you know the fact that we're out there and getting people excited about Mars and and space in general, I think is is a good thing, regardless of where your actual passions lie. You know, it doesn't have to be that I want to be an engineer or I want to be an astronaut. It could be whatever you want to do, just to help. You know, but also doing it in pursuit of actually settling Mars or the Moon or 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 beyond. I agree. Um... Another question I have for you too, Scott, is that, so right now you're currently making the suits uh, for MDRS. Uh, are you also helping make the suits for any of the other chapters or is that something that's on the table where they can reach out to you and actually get assistance for their suits for other chapters as well? Sure, I, I would be happy to assist any of the other chapters who are interested in developing analog suits. Um, they are a, a bit involved to make. <laughs> But uh, and we did a lot of trial and error, um, and uh, we've learned from a lot of our mistakes. But uh, our common two-piece suits, uh, we have six of them at the MDRS, are all made out of common parts that you could, um, that are fairly easy to obtain and aren't terribly expensive. Most of the, uh, most of the work is in, in putting everything together and, uh, um, modifying things to to uh to make them uh work for you but um so it, it'll take some elbow grease but it is um it's very doable none of this none of these suits are super advanced if you look at the electronics they're intentionally uh rather simple uh they need to be robust and they need to be um able to uh troubleshoot them um at the MDRS by engineering, you know, the engineers on the crews without a lot of uh, handholding. So we need to make them straightforward, clear, and, f you know, few parts that can break down. And they get a lot of wear and tear on them. I mean, uh, they might not look as good as some of the cosplay suits people have developed, but they are working suits. And it's they will often go through, a, you know, a dozen different crews every season, every crew season at the MDRS and lots of people and they just get a lot of wear and tear. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these EVAs can go from four to six hours long and, and the suits get pretty worn. So our goal is to try to make them as robust and kind of have that experience of being on Mars as much as we can do within the confines of the simulation. Cool. So and also be somebody, safe. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Safety is very important. If somebody uh, suddenly, uh, you know, ha has a coughing fit or has to throw up or something that you need to get the helmet off of them quickly uh, out on an EVA and break simulation, it is very important to be able to do so. Uh, and and if somebody has a, a bad fall or something like that, you need to be able to get them out of the suit quickly so you can uh, do uh, medical care for them. So safety is an, another 
big important aspect of, of designing these suits. Okay, amazing. So if somebody, uh, so if one of the other chapters want to get in touch with you in terms mm -hmm. of uh, talking about suits, how, how are they best uh, able to find you? Uh, they can email directly uh, to me. Uh, my email address is uh, uh, mars.sim at gmail.com. Okay. And uh, they can also uh, contact our, our chapter. Um, our website is norcal.marssociety.org. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else that you want to talk about today, Scott? Uh, no, that's mostly <laughs> it. Um, I. One thing I did want to mention um, to anyone uh, doing chapters, uh, state chapters, national chapters, whatever, the Mars Society, um, one thing I highly recommend is to hold regular monthly meetings. Uh, even if you don't have a lot to talk about, holding monthly meetings, uh, even virtual meetings during the pandemic is extremely important to keep people invested and being you know, a part of the group, keeping the, the group uh, together. Uh, so I highly recommend it doesn't have to be the same day every month, you know, doesn't have to be perfectly spaced out, but just try to have a meeting every month. And that's a good way of, of keeping your chapter going and keeping everyone invested. No, it's fantastic. Great advice. I mean, I think that's great advice for, you know, regardless of what sector you're in. I mean, it's, you know, this has been, it's been tough on people, you know, it's, uh, you know, the isolation, it's, it's interesting. We're almost all in a sim. <laughs> We're all having to, you know, get, you know, especially, you know, Evan, uh, to kind of bring you back into, into the conversation. I mean, with your background in psychology, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I'm sure you can really appreciate the fact that you want to, you know, these touch points and touching base. I mean, maybe if you want to add something to that as well, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what to do and, and keep it in touch for the chapters. Sure. I mean, yeah, human and connectivity is always important. Um, and I mean, even outside of the Mars Society, just keeping connected during this time is it's essential. A lot of people are being isolated. And um, yeah, I, I, we do the same, Scott. That's, that's a great idea. Just keep keep the ball rolling, right? Awesome. So I want to bring up an image here that I should have brought this up earlier. Let's see if you guys can see that on the screen. So it really just wanted to, to show the representation of the Mars Society from the chapters uh, globally, regionally, that you can see that, you know, there is a fair bit of coverage <laughs> on the planet for, you know, the reach of the Mars Society as a whole. So I just wanted to thank you. Uh, thank you all. I mean, it's amazing that, uh, you know, without the chapters, without the chapter heads, without your drive and your passion and your advocacy, you know, this really isn't isn't going to be possible. You know, it's not. You know, it uh, it takes. You know, you say it takes a village to raise a, a kid. It takes it takes a, a lot of chapters to really, you know, reach the planet. And you guys are doing just an amazing and fantastic job. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you all for uh, showing up tonight, and uh, you know, re really spending your time uh, with us. I mean, that's that's something that I think you know, uh, we don't give enough credit for is that you know, the time is is valuable. You know, there's not a lot of it. We're all very busy. And the fact that you, you know, took time out of your day to come speak with everybody, I really want to say thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, so before we go, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, to make mention, of course, a very special event is happening tomorrow. Uh, you might have all been aware. <laughs> Inspiration4 is launching. Uh, and the reason I you kind of want to bring it up, I want to obviously, you know, wish them well. And because uh, Dr. Proctor actually is a former MDRS crew member. So she was actually uh, on one of the crews uh, in the past. So we want to kind of just, you know, wish her well. And uh, now I was trying to think of what are the best, you know, the, the words that I could use the most to actually say that. So I thought, you know what, uh, I can probably do better than that. So actually I reached out to uh, Dr. Pandya today, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. And I asked her, can I, you know, she made a video today to actually wish them all well. So I thought I would actually play that video for everybody today. Uh, you know, and I'm definitely, you know, I really appreciate uh, the words that she that she chose today was just, just fabulous. So I'm just gonna play this for everybody and uh, here we go. It's we thought it audio for me. Yeah, it's muted for me. As, it's muted for me as well. Well, let me see. 
Are you not hearing it at all, guys? No, I can't hear it at all, unfortunately. Let me try one more time. I hear that can happen on this. So what I'm going to do, though, is I am just because I think, you know, I have I have seen this uh, run into a problem before. So what I'm going to do is stop the screen. We'll try one more time. So bear with me. This is a live show. Of course, things just have to actually just just to make my uh, my job a little bit harder. So I'm going to share, share audio checkbox on the next window. Your screen. Okay, there we go. And it's probably just because I did not do that properly. Okay, so we're going to try one more time. If not, I will put the link in, and I want everybody to go and watch that if because uh, you're going to love it. No? No, not for me, Ron. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste this into the comments. And sorry about that, guys. Uh, it uh, It's supposed to work. I did share the audio, but it's deciding that it's going to make my life a little hard today just because we're on a live show. Why not? Okay, so I'm just going to put that in the comments there. Uh, so I, I really encourage you to go over to her page and look for the video that she actually shared out for inspiration for. And of course I want to say, uh, thank you, uh, very, or, you know, thank you. Good, you know, well wishes to you. I mean, it's fantastic. I can't even imagine, <laughs> uh, the experience that you're getting to have. I mean, it's just, uh, wow. I mean, that's, that's crazy. So I'm just going to put that up there. Uh, I'm going to take this, stop the screen and put that up there for everybody. So I definitely I encourage you to go to Dr. Pandya, uh, go to her Facebook profile and she has that video that she shared out today. Uh, and the words she used are just, I mean, uh, they were just phenomenal. That's why I reached out to her and said, can I share this? And of course that didn't work out according to plan, but <laughs> at least I'm sharing the mention of it. So I wanted to thank you guys again. Uh, you know, it was really fantastic. I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. And, uh, you know, if there's any closing thoughts, uh, uh, go ahead. So I'll just kind of go around once, uh, you know, again, if you want to mention your membership drive. So Evan, if you want to take it away, uh, closing thoughts and uh, where can we find Mars Society Canada? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to learn more about Mars Society of Canada, just go to marssociety.ca and you can find uh, our membership page and, and uh, how to join and uh, our future activities. And uh, Ron, I wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. You're doing a wonderful job. Absolute pleasure to be here. An honor to be counted amongst you gentlemen. And uh, thank you to everybody who's, who's part of this mission. We're, we're, we're doing something special and uh, we're really paving the way to a, a, a future that's exciting. So thank you, Ron, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Julio, if you wanted to, uh, some closing thoughts, and then uh, again, how do we find uh, the Brazil chapter and how do we become members? Okay, thanks so much for the for the this opportunity to talk about what, what we are doing in Brazil. Uh, also, we, we have a WhatsApp group, uh, in this WhatsApp group, we are sharing the, the meetings. Generally, we are having meetings during Mondays. Uh, 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 it's, it's very easy to contact me. Uh, look, look in my contacts in the social media. It's, it's maybe easier. Uh, and also, it will be it's just to send me a message and it will be adding. But the, the Brazilian chapter is based in Portuguese, but sometimes we are develop some activities also in, in English. Uh, but we are very open to collaborate, collaborate internationally. Also, everybody are welcome to, to develop some activities in the, uh, in the Brazilian analogue habitat. Uh, also, some, some possible research will be uh, possibly uh, 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 as feasible to operate remotely. Uh, we'll be also adding some research, international international research in our facilities. Or if someone would like to to visit us in Brazil, everybody are welcome. Awesome, thank you uh, very much, Julio, for coming today. And uh, Scott, if you want to take it away and close out the show, and you're on mute there, Scott. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, I appreciate that. 
get a chance to talk about what my chapter is doing. Uh, if anybody is in the Northern California area and would like to join us, uh, simply go to our website at norcal.marssociety.org and it should have all information about our upcoming events and uh, how to join our mailing list. We're very open and welcome to anyone joining us. And if you have any interest in uh, the, the uh, sim suits that we work on, feel free to contact us. We might be able to uh, work with you on developing your own sim suits as, as well. That's awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody. It's fantastic. Uh, again, I appreciate all your time tonight for coming out. Uh, it was absolutely just just amazing show, and I really appreciate everything you've done. Uh, I want to say thank you to the audience. So I think from that, we will bid you adieu. And uh, everybody, watch that Inspiration4 launch tomorrow. Right. And uh, thank you very much. And we will close out the show with the video. See you later, everybody. Thanks for coming. Congratulations. Sure. Well. I know. Congratulations, Scott. Sometime in the next few decades, humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. That is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars.